Good morning. This joint hearing of the Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight and the Subcommittee on Energy Environment will come to order. I welcome everyone here to this hearing, Nuclear Energy Risk Management. In front of you are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures for today's witnesses. Before we get started, since this is a joint hearing involving two subcommittees, I want to explain how we will operate procedurally so all members understand how the question and answer period will be handled. As always, we will alternate between the majority and minority members and allow all members an opportunity for questioning before recognizing a member for a second round of questions, if we have time for the second round. We will recognize those members present at the gavel in order of seniority on the full committee, and those coming in after the gavel will be recognized in the order of their arrival. I now recommend, recognize myself for a five-minute opening statement. I'd first like to welcome our witnesses to today's hearing and express my sincere appreciation for their effort in joining us here today. Risk assessment and risk management associated with nuclear energy are important and timely topics for the Science Committee to address. This topic is clearly a priority for the Science Committee as two of our subcommittees are here today together. While the effects and implications of the Japanese earthquake the tsunami and resulting nuclear disaster are still being determined. It is an opportunity for us to assess, to reassess our nation's current safety posture here in this country. After the Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, September 11th, and several other incidents, the United States regularly re revisited the state of our nuclear power infrastructure. Today's hearing is yet another opportunity to evaluate whether we, as a nation, are doing everything that we can to ensure that nuclear energy is a safe component of our energy supply. This includes evaluating the current research and development portfolio for, for reactor safety, spent fuel storage, and public health monitoring. The Department of Energy was invited to this morning's hearing and would have provided a valuable contribution to the hearing. Unfortunately, they were unable to provide a witness here today. DOE did provide written comments, but that does not substitute for actual appearing. Testifying is not a correspondence course. The Science Committee understands the many demands that agency officials have on their time. As members of Cong Congress, we have similar demands. Because of this, the committee provided four weeks of notice and did not request a specific individual, leaving that determination to DOE. Unfortunately, it seems as though the entire department only has one individual that they believe is qualified to speak on the issues that we are addressing here today. And he was otherwise engaged for multiple days. While I find this troubling in and of itself, what is more frustrating is that this has now become a trend for this administration. The TSA refused to testify at a hearing earlier this year before the INO subcommittee. Two days ago, EPA refused to testify before the full committee unless they could dictate the terms of their attendance. Let me be clear. This committee is willing to work with the administration to reach mutual accommodations, but it will not allow it to obstruct our oversight efforts. We take our oversight responsibilities very seriously. This administration's arrogance continues to undermine its claims of transparency and openness, particularly when they fail to be accountable to Congress and to the American people. If the administration is not willing to work with this committee, we have several options that can compel their cooperation. Unfortunately, it appears we may have to exercise those options in the future. For the witnesses that did appear today, I want to sincerely thank you for your cooperation. The chair now recognizes Ms. Edwards for an opening statement. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. I look forward to today's hearing and thank the witnesses because I think for far too long we've heard just a drumbeat about how nuclear energy is both safe and efficient with electricity produced, quote unquote, too cheap to meter. I want to thank the chairman for giving members a chance to get to the bottom of these claims and others. The idea of nuclear power as a cost effective source of power can be traced back to a statement in 1954 by the then chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission who suggested that, quote, our children will enjoy in their homes electrical energy too cheap to meter. Um, unfortunately, that same year, of course, General Electric ran an advertisement, which I'm uh, attaching to my statement. It's quite interesting from 19, uh, 1954. Uh, that optimistically trumpeted how the industry would be on its own two feet within five to ten years. That was in 1954. After suggesting that the big question on atomic energy was whether it could be done economically, the ad says, and I quote, we already know the kinds of plants which will be feasible, how they will operate, and we can estimate what their expenses will be. In five years, certainly within ten, a number of them will be operating at about the same cost as those using coal. They will be privately financed and built without government subsidy. And so here we are, and it's 2011, and the reality is that nuclear power has always required government subsidies. In the almost 60 years since that ad appeared, the taxpayer has seen more than $80 billion spent on nuclear power research and development. In fact, it is the largest single energy research area since 1948. And there are billions and billions and billions of dollars in other subsidies created through government actions designed to distort markets to give nuclear power a competitive edge over other sources of energy. Uh, although we are in a discussion now about how heavily subsidized the uh, oil industry is. Despite decades of support, nuclear power plants are still unable to operate competitively in the United States energy market. And now we're being asked for still more subsidies to build another generation of plants. According to an analysis by the Union of Concerned Scientists, these subsidies could be worth twice as much as the value of the electricity produced by the plants. That strikes me as throwing a lot of good money after bad. We recently held a hearing on renewable energy in which the majority seemed to want to make the point that subsidizing renewable ener energy would be picking winners and losers. And yet that same strategy uh, that energy produced uh, would not be competitive without government support is being used with respect to the nuclear industry. Well, if you truly reject such support, the nuclear power industry should be the poster child for an industry that needs government to prop it up, prop it up and prop it up to the tune of billions of dollars. I support subsidies to help emerging energy sources such as wind and solar and battery technologies. They deserve at least as much of a chance as nuclear has had. And since nuclear cannot stand on its own feet after 60 years, it's time to say enough. The public gravy train has got to come to a stop for now for this mature industry. And it is indeed a mature industry. It just can't stand on its own. And as claims of safety, the events in J Japan's Fukushima plant illustrate how safety is contingent on a complex set of systems all working perfectly. If those systems go down, system safety starts to slip beyond our control. Natural disasters and human folly know no national bounds, and it would be beyond arrogant to think that something similar to Fukushima could not happen here in the United States. To avoid another accident requires aggressive regulators, safety-minded operators, and perfect luck. As was illustrated in a recent New York Times article attached also to my statement, Operators often confuse profit margins with safety margins, and regulators are too passive or overwhelmed to always enforce accountability. In fact, it's, there are claims that the regulatory agency is too cozy with the industry. A recent report from the Union of Concerned Scientists documents 14 near misses in just the past year, including one at Maryland's own Calvert Cliffs plant, located approximately 50 miles from where we sit today. Calvert Cliffs has two reactors. In February 2010, both reactors were automatically shut down. The cause of the shutdown was that water had shorted out a degraded piece of electrical equi equipment that had neither been inspected nor replaced. A subsequent study uh, investigation by the NRC revealed that the water resulted from chronic roof leaks. In fact, the NRC found that there were 58 outstanding work orders to repair roof leaks, and despite some of the orders being two years old, not one of them had be even been scheduled for repair. 
Each shutdown, like the one at Calvert Cliffs, cost plan owners and ultimately ratepayers an average of more than $1.5 billion. And since the Three Mile Island accident, safety failures have resulted in plant shutdowns costing more than $80 billion. And so we subsidize the energy, cre the industry's creation, the building of plants, the production of electricity, and then we subsidize the failure of plant managers. I think enough is enough, and with that, I yield. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. I uh, now recognize the chairman of the subcommittee on the energy and environment, Dr. Harris, for his opening statement. Uh, Dr. Harris, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses also for being here today to testify on issues relating to nuclear energy risk management, and I do look forward to hearing from all your testimony. Uh, first, I'd like to echo Dr. Braun's disappointment with the Department of Energy's inability to provide a witness for the hearing. Now, I do recognize that the head of the Office of Nuclear Energy was unavailable due to international travel, but I would hope that in a program with a budget of over $850 million that the department has more than one individual qualified to represent it before Congress. The purpose of this hearing is to examine nuclear energy safety, risk assessment, and public health protection. Nuclear energy is clearly an integral piece of America's energy portfolio today and will probably continue to be in the future. In Maryland, my state, one-third of our electricity is generated by nuclear reactors, and the state is home to two reactors located near my district at Calvert Cliffs. DOE's Energy Information Administration projects that U.S. electricity demand will increase by 31 percent over the next 25 years. We simply have to get this electricity from somewhere, and nuclear energy may indeed provide a clean, safe, and affordable source of baseload power to meet this demand. However, as with all critical energy sources, producing nuclear energy is certainly not without risk, and we must take great care to appropriately manage those risks. The March earthquake and tsunami in Japan clearly serve as a stark reminder of this. However, it is important to note that the incident and response at Fukushima did not happen in a vacuum. Both the nuclear industry and government regulators continually assess safety measures and mitigate those kind of risks. Largely due to this diligence and attentiveness, Nuclear facilities in this country are among the safest workplaces across all industries, and not a single death has ever been attributed to nuclear energy production here in the United States. As I hope to hear today, continued improvements in reactor design and operating procedures will make what is already safe nuclear energy even safer. To this end, I'm interested in learning how the federal government can best prioritize its nuclear energy research programs to further reduce these risks. I'm also interested in key policy questions associated with nuclear energy risk management. For example, is a Fukushima-like event even possible here in the U.S., given our regulatory environment and reactor design? Do facilities pre-stage the necessary equipment to manage unexpected incidents? What are the comparative risks associated with storage of spent nuclear fuel, scattered throughout the country or consolidated into centralized storage, such as Yucca Mountain? Finally, as a medical doctor by training, I believe it's important to objectively and responsibly discuss potential radiologic effects on public health. Senior government officials encouraging Americans to stockpile potassium iodide pills due to detection of minuscule traces of radiation is simply not responsible, since potassium iodide can obviously have harmful results if those pills are unnecessarily taken. This kind of alarmism also feeds unnecessary public fears about nuclear energy, potentially harming its future viability. I hope the witnesses can help pers provide perspective on this issue. I look forward to in hearing today's discussion surrounding these topics. Again, I thank you all for appearing. I thank the chairman for holding the hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Harris. If there are members who would like to uh, Submit additional opening statements. Your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our panel of witnesses. Dr. Brian Sharon, is that correct? I think, uh, Director Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Mr. Lake Barrett, Principal Consultant, Barrett Consulting, LLC. Mr. John Boyce, Scientific Director, International Epidemiology Institute and Professor of Medicine, Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. And um, Mr. Doc and Doc, Mr. Dave Lockbaum, Director of Nuclear Safety Project, Union of Concerned Scientists. As our witnesses should 
should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes, and I would ask you, because we're really pressed, we're going to have votes about 9.45 or 10 o'clock, so please limit your testimony to five minutes. If you can shave a few seconds off that, we would appreciate it, but we don't want to shortchange either. Uh, after your, your spoken testimony, members of the subcommittees will have five minutes each to ask questions. Your written testimony be, will be included in the record of the hearing. It is the practice of subcommittee on investigations and oversight to re receive testimony under oath, and we will use that practice today as well. Do any of you have any objection to taking an oath? You can shake your head, it'd be fine. <laughs> Let the record reflect that all witnesses have shook, shook in their head from side to side, indicate that they have no objection to taking an oath. Uh, you may also be represented by counsel. Do any of you have counsel here today? Let the record reflect that none of the witnesses have counsel, indicated by their shaking their head from side to side. Uh, if you would now please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear and affirm to tell the whole truth and, no, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the ref record reflect that all witnesses participating have taken the oath. Uh, thank you. You may sit down. I now, now recognize our first witness, Dr. Brian Sharon, Director of the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, NRC. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sharon, uh, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Harrison Brown, Ranking Members Miller and Edwards, members of the subcommittees. I'm pleased to appear before you on behalf of the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, to discuss the agency's research program and our current activities in response to the events that have occurred at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant site. My name is Brian Sharon. I've been a director of the NRC's Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research for the past five years, and I've been at the NRC and its predecessor agency, the Atomic Energy Commission, for nearly 38 years. The following testimony is intended to provide an overview of NRC's Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, or RES, and its current activities, as well as provide a discussion of the agency task force and research activities related to the Fukushima Daiichi event in Japan. Office of Research is a major NRC program office, mandated by Congress and created along with the NRC in 1975. The NRC's regulatory research program addresses issues in the areas of nuclear reactors, nuclear materials, and radioactive waste. My office plans, recommends, and implements programs of nuclear regulatory research, standards development, and resolution of generic issues for nuclear power plants and other facilities regulated by the NRC. There are currently about 260 staff members in, um, in, in my office. We do not conduct research for the primary purpose of developing improved te technologies. That's a function that is more appropriately uh, the nuclear industries. Rather, the NRC conducts research to confirm that the methods and data generated by the industry ensure that adequate safety margins are, are, are maintained. We work with the offices that are responsible for licensing ac activities within the NRC to develop appropriate regulatory actions to resolve potential safety issues for nuclear power plants and other facilities regulated by the NRC, including those issues designed as, uh, designated as generic issues. Generic issues are potential technical or security issues that could impact two or more facilities. My office coordinates the development of consensus and voluntary standards for agency use including appointment of agency staff to numerous domestic and international standards committees. Participation by the NRC staff in consensus standards development is essential because the codes and standards are an integral part of the agency's regulatory framework. We have implemented over 100 international cooperative agreements with other nuclear regulators and international or organizations to share information and leverage resources. We also participate extensively in several international atomic energy agency and Organization for Economic and Cooperation and Development nuclear energy agency committees and working groups that facilitate the exchange of information between countries on topics such as risk assessment, events, and best practices. 
The NRC has a robust reactor operating experience program, and we have taken advantage of the lessons learned from previous operating experience to implement a program of continuous improvement for the U.S. Uh, reactor fleet. As you know, on Friday, March 11, 2011, an earthquake and subsequent uh, tsunami occurred near the northeast coast of Japan, resulting in the shutdown of more than 10 uh, reactors. From what we know now, it is likely that the earthquake caused the loss of normal alternating current power, and, is, and it is likely that the reactor's response to the earthquake went as designed. The ensuing tsunami, however, caused the loss of emergency AC power to four of the six units at the Fukushima site. The phenomena associated with the events at Fukushima involve numerous disciplines in which my office has expertise and has done substantial research. I would now like to discuss some of these technical areas that have been raised since the events. Uh, the Office of Research does, uh, seismic, has a seismic research program that is currently addressing updated geological assessments, particularly in the central and eastern United States. Uh, we've also initiated a current tsunami research program in 2006, and our tsunami research leverages work being done at the United States Geologic Survey and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And this will help form the basis for NRC review of new license applications. We've performed significant severe accident research since the TMI-2 accident to better understand the phenomena and improve both accident prevention and, and mitigation. Um, the NRC has been using probabilistic risk assessment or PRA methods to obtain estimates of risk associated with severe accidents since 1975. Um, the NRC has previously studied spent fuel pool issues and implemented additional requirements to minimize spent fuel pool vulnerabilities. Following the events in Japan, we have begun to update spent fuel pool studies to estimate the relative consequence of removing older fuel from the spent fuel pool and placing it into dry storage versus leaving it in the spent fuel pool. Um, in conclusion, I want to reiterate that the NRC has a very robust regulatory research program that performs confirmatory research to allow the licensing offices to make technically informed regulatory decisions. The research office has expertise in a multitude of technical disciplines and has performed significant research in the past related to reactors, materials, and waste. In light of the events in Japan, the NRC has initiated a near-term evaluation of the events relevance to reactors in the U.S., and we are continuing to gather the information necessary for us to take a longer, more thorough look at the events and their lessons for us. Based on the lessons learned from these efforts, we will pursue additional regulatory actions and research as needed to ensure the continuing safety of the U.S. fleet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharon. I now recognize our next witness, Mr. Lake Barrett, principal of L. Barrett Consulting. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Edwards, and Chairman Hall. I appreciate the opportunity to be here before you today. Uh, I'd like to quickly try to go through what happened at Fukushima Daiichi plant. It's a large six reactor facility on the northeast coast of Japan. On March 11th, there was a huge earthquake. Uh, the earthquake was slightly beyond the design basis of the plant, but the safety systems all performed functional perform satisfactorily uh, there. Uh, there was a greater than design basis tsunami. It's a huge wave. It surrounded the plant, uh, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner. And this wave, uh, when it hit it, it took out all the emergency AC power in the plant. Uh, they were able to cool the core for approximately eight hours using a backup uh, system that was operated with batteries. After about eight hours, the battery power exhausted and there was no more cooling, and the core started to uncover and overheat. As the core overheated, uh, it started to, to melt. There was a steam uh, cladding uh, interaction that produced hydrogen. Uh, this led to an overpressurization. Uh, the, the primary containment was vented to the secondary containment, and there was hydrogen gas in that. That led to an explosion in the Unit 1 building. Uh, and then there was a, another explosion in the Unit 3 building. Units 1, 2, and 3 were operating at the time of the earthquake and tsunami. Uh, the operators started to inject seawater and to cool the core and through this feed and bleed operation. Uh, they are doing that to this day now. Uh, they are working to, to restore recirculation cooling. Uh, they also have had to spray water up onto the spent fuel pools, which are in the upper areas with fire trucks in the beginning. They now have an in injection with uh, injection booms with a concrete injection pump. Uh, 
30 years ago at Three Mile Island, there was another accident that had core degradation to it. It was entirely different reasons for the accident at Three Mile Island. Uh, it was the Unit 2 reactor, which is in the, in the uh, far ground on this photo. At Three Mile Island, it was an operator uh, misunderstanding on the, on the reactor system. Uh, there was an abnormal shutdown and a valve stuck open. The operators thought it was closed, and the operators thought there was too much water in the reactor, when in reality there was not enough. They turned off the emergency pumps, and this led to the uh, core being overheated. <clears throat> it melted uh, approximately a little over half of the core. Uh, this is what I expect we'll find at Fukushima when they eventually get inside. Uh, hydrogen gas was generated. The hydrogen gas did have a deflagration event, but it was contained primarily with inside the reactor building. There was about a half a million gallons of highly radioactive water on the floor of the containment building. This would be a sequence of how the core would melt and, and redistribute down toward the bottom of the vessel, which again, uh, as reported last night from Japan, is a situation likely in Unit 1. Um, the Three Mile Island, a sophisticated cleanup systems were installed uh, in the spent fuel pool, which was empty. Uh, special re refueling tools to defuel the the damaged core was placed in canisters. Uh, this was safely completed in about a decade, uh, cost about a billion dollars, and about three million gallons of highly radioactive water was, uh, was processed. At Fukushima, the, uh, uh, they are still stabilizing the plant. It is not stable yet. They're working to establish better cooling. They are working to mitigate the airborne releases, which are unmonitored. Uh, they are working to capture the 10 plus million gallons of highly radioactive water that's in the plant and gain access uh, this is just a little picture of the four reactors that are severely damaged at Fukushima. Another little slide angle, you can see some of the vapors coming off probably the spent fuel pools and the reactors which are located down in the lower uh, parts of the buildings. They are taking mitigative actions to mitigate the airborne effluents, such as spraying resins and fixatives on the contaminated soil on the plant site. There's also the work to contain the tens of millions of gallons of highly radioactive water. They have robotic equipment trying to remove the highly radioactive debris uh, from the site so they can gain access to the buildings inside. There is some off-site contamination, um, but it is, it is not uh, that severe, but nonetheless it is significant. Uh, observations on Fukushima, uh, it is not a public health catastrophe. Uh, it certainly is an industrial plant catastrophe. The tsunami was the, the critical safety matter. Uh, I think units one and four are complete loss. The cleanup, I believe, can be done. The technology is there. We had it 30 years ago at Three Mile Island, uh, and it is much better today than it was, was back then. The Japanese have a, have a strong technological society, and I believe they can, they can handle this in the future. But they still have challenges. Uh, and they, uh, as far as U.S. plants are, I believe they have adequate safety margins today. Uh, the tsunami risk was the main issue here. That is primarily limited to the northwest coast of the United States. We have no operating reactors there on the coast, but there are two uh, shutdown reactors that have spent fuel that is stored there, um, and, and that's a risk that probably shouldn't be there. But it's a small risk because it's in dry storage. Uh, the United States has done a lot of uh, work in severe accident improvements over the past decades, and I think that is a good basis for the United States. But we need to have a systematic, methodical, risk-informed, lessons learned evaluation. The industry is doing it, and so is the NRC. Um, we should resist quick fixed emotional reactions uh, to this until we get the facts and learn what's going to, what has happened and what is the right act course of action. Uh, the lessons learned from Three Mile Island greatly improve U.S. nuclear safety and productivity. The most painful lessons are the most teachable lessons, and we had very painful lessons at Three Mile Island, and we're undergoing one now at Fukushima. But I believe history will probably look back, if we keep on a steady course, that Fukushima will improve our entire energy situation, improve safety and performance for the future, just like Three Mile Island did 30 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Barrett. We've been notified that uh, we'll be taking <coughs> votes shortly, but what we're going to do is we're going to hear from the last two witnesses and then recess. We're going to go vote and we're going to come back for questions. So I now recognize our next witness, Dr. John Boyce, Scientific Director of the International Epidemiology Institute. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Members and Members of the Subcommittee. Um, oh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Members and Members of the Subcommittee. I'm a radiation epidemiologist and I've spent my entire career studying populations exposed to radiation, from Chernobyl cleanup workers to populations living near nuclear power plants. I was in Hiroshima just a few days before the accident as a member of the Science Council of the Radiation Effects Research Foundation reviewing the study of atomic bomb survivors. Fukushima is not like Chernobyl. 
The Chernobyl accident resulted in massive radiation exposures. There was no containment vessel and a fire burned for 10 days spewing radioactive material into the environment. The first responders and the firefighters received so much radiation that 28 died of acute radiation sickness within a few months. Radioactive iodines were deposited on large areas and were ingested by grass-eating cows who gave milk that was drunk by children and an epidemic of thyroid cancer resulted. In contrast, Fukushima appears to have resulted in substantially lower worker and public exposures. The Japanese authorities raised the annual limit of worker exposure from 2 to 25 rem, but only 21 workers received more than 10 rem. And these levels are far below the hundreds of rem needed to cause acute radiation sickness. But they are sufficient to increase the lifetime risk of developing cancer over their lifetimes by about 1%. Exposure to the public was minimal, in large part because the prevailing winds blew much of the radioactive releases toward the ocean and because of the actions taken by the Japanese authorities. They evacuated people living within 20 kilometers of the Fukushima plant and recommended that those within 30 kilometers stay indoors to minimize exposure. They monitored the food and water supplies and banned the shipment of foodstuffs and milk when the radiation levels exceeded allowable standards. These protective measurements, including the distribution of stable iodine pills or syrup for children, minimized public doses and subsequent, there was unlikely to be any or minimal health consequences. This is borne out in a survey of over 1,000 children who had their thyroids measured for possible uptakes of radioactive iodine. Not one child had a measurement above normal. Nonetheless, some of the prevailing winds did blow towards populated areas, and these areas will be a concern for remediation before allowing public access or return. Fukushima is 5,000 miles away from the United States, and radiation is substantially diluted after traveling such a long distance. The detection of trace amounts of radiation speaks more about the sensitivity of our detectors than to the possible consequences to public health. They pose no threat to human health. They represent at most only a tiny fraction of what we receive each day from daily sources of radiation. The minute levels of radioactive iodine detected in milk in Washington State were 5,000 times below the levels set by the FDA to trigger concern. An infant would have to drink hundreds of gallons of milk to receive a radiation dose equivalent to a day's worth of natural background radiation exposure. These trace levels are not a public health concern, and potassium iodide tablets should not be taken as a preventive measure to block the thyroid's uptake of such tiny levels. There are potential adverse effects from taking these tablets, and these risks have to be a balanced against a non-existent benefit. We live in a radioactive world. If I could have that first slide. Uh, and comparisons might help place the radiation levels from Fukushima in context. Practically all the food we eat contains small amounts of naturally occurring radioactive elements. We breathe radioactive radon. Bricks and granite contain radioactive materials that emit gamma radiation. The Capitol building has some of the highest radiation levels in the United States. Water contains small amounts of radioactive radium, thorium, and uranium. These examples are not to minimize the health consequences of high and moderate level exposures, but just to place in perspective the tiny amounts from Fukushima which pose no public health problems to the United States. The Fukushima accident, however, highlights the need for continued health research to fill important gaps in knowledge. We know much about the effects of high levels of radiation when received briefly as was the case for the atomic bomb survivors whose exposure was in less than a second. However, the risk following exposures experienced gradually and of concern, these are over long periods of time, is uncertain and remains the major unanswered question in radiation epidemiology and risk assessment. One untapped opportunity that should not be wasted is to study our own U.S. radiation workers and veterans. The low-dose radiation program within the Department of Energy had the foresight to provide seed money to evaluate the feasibility of studying one million Americans, and this comprehensive work should continue. 
The study populations include the Department of Energy and Manhattan Project workers, atomic veterans who participated in nuclear weapons tests, nuclear utility workers, and others. Thank you very much for this opportunity to appear before you. Thank you very much, Dr. Boyce. And now I recognize our final witness, Dr. Dave Lockbaum, the Director of Nuclear Safety Project for the Union of Concerned Scientists. Mr. Good, Lockbaum. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Edwards, and other members of the subcommittees. On behalf of the Union of Concerned Scientists, I appreciate this opportunity to share our perspectives. My written testimony described lessons already evident from the Fukushima disaster that are applicable to ensuring safer nuclear power plants in the United States. This morning, I'd like to focus on three of those lessons. The first lesson involves severe accident management guidance. In NRC terminology, a severe accident involves some fuel damage. The NRC and the nuclear industry representatives have claimed that the severe accident management guidelines developed after the Three Mile and Meltdown would protect us from the problems faced at Fukushima. They have not been telling the whole story. As broadcaster Paul Harvey used to say, here's the rest of the story. The entry for severe accident management guidelines in NRC Manual Chapter 0308 states, quote, the staff concluded that regular inspection was not appropriate because the guidelines are voluntary and have no regulatory basis, end quote. The NRC never checks the guidelines to determine if they might actually work under severe accident conditions. From March 2009 until March 2010, I worked for the NRC as an instructor at their technical training center. My duties included teaching the severe accident management guidelines to NRC employees. I and the other instructors emphasized that NRC inspectors were not authorized to evaluate the adequacy of the guidelines. Plant owners are required to have the guidelines while NRC inspectors are required not to assess them. If the NRC continues to rely on these guidelines to protect public health, it must evaluate their effectiveness. It would be too late and too costly to find out after a nuclear plant disaster that the guidelines were missing a few key steps or contained a handful of missteps. The second lesson involves upgraded guidance for spent fuel pool events. As I mentioned, the NRC and the nuclear industry upgraded the procedures used by the operators during reactor core accidents. The upgraded procedures provide the operators with the full array of options available to deal with a reactor core accident, not just those options relying on emergency equipment. In addition, the upgraded procedures would help the operators handle problems like unavailable or misleading instrumentation readings. No such procedures and associated training are available to help the operators deal with spent fuel pool events. The NRC must require robust procedures for spent fuel pool problems comparable to those available for reactor core problems so that the operators can prevent fuel damage from occurring or mitigate its consequences when those efforts fail. The last lesson involves additional regulatory requirements for defueled reactors. When the earthquake and tsunami happened in Japan, the reactor core in Fukushima Unit 4 was fully offloaded into the spent fuel pool. This configuration is termed a defueled condition. There's a gaping hole in the regulatory safety net when reactors are defueled. When the NRC issues operating licenses for reactors, Appendix A to that license contains the technical specifications. These specifications establish, quote, the lowest functional capability or performance levels of equipment required for safe operation of the facility, end quote, along with the scope and frequency of testing required to demonstrate that capability. The operational condition of the reactor determines which, which requirements are applicable when. When the entire reactor core has been offloaded into the spent fuel pool, very few requirements still apply. For example, the containment structure surrounding the spent fuel pool is no longer required to be available, to be intact. This containment significantly reduces the amount of radioactivity reaching the environment from damaged fuel in the spent fuel pool, but only when it's intact. Likewise, the specifications do not require normal power, backup power, or even battery power to be available. When the fuel is in the reactor core, the specifications mandate safety measures to protect Americans from that hazard. But when that hazard is entirely relocated to the spent fuel pool, nearly all those safety measures can be removed. The NRC must fix this deficiency as soon as possible to provide adequate protection of public health when reactor cores are defueled. In the interim, the NRC should seriously consider banning full core reactor offloads into the spent fuel pools. In conclusion, the measures we have recommended will lessen the chance of a disaster at a U.S. nuclear power plant. But if it happens anyway, the federal government would be able to look Americans in the eye and said, we took every reasonable measure to protect you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lockbaum. The uh, committee will now uh, recess uh, so that we can go and vote. We'll reconvene five minutes after the last vote. Committee's in recess.